There we go. Okie dokie. Two chapters this week. As we're getting closer towards the end and turning our attention into preparing for the CERT exam. Uh, these two chapters will focus on incident response and digital forensics. Interestingly enough, the, the book has them reverse of how people normally go through them. It's normal digital forensics first and then incident response, but whatever. We're gonna cover the, the yin and yang together. And we're gonna start with incident response. Because no matter how strong your security protections are, something is going to go wrong. Organizations need an ongoing, ever improving incident response plan, process, team, technology, skills, and training to respond appropriately. Here is the incident response process. It is a circle because it continues to get updated every time. In the preparation stage, it's all about building the tools, the processes, the procedures to respond to an incident. That can include training a, an incident response team, conducting exercises, documenting what will be done, who's responsible for what, acquiring, configuring, and operating security tools. Identification helps review events to identify incidents. Uh, this stage pays attention to indicators of compromise, log analysis, and security monitoring capabilities along with comprehensive awareness and reporting uh, program for the staff. Containment is once an incident is identified, the IR team has to contain to prevent further issues or damage. Containment can be challenging and may not be complete if elements are not identified in the initial steps. Eradication would be removing the artifacts associated with that incident. It also involves the rebuilding and restoration of system and applications for backups. Uh, recovery is the full restoration to normal, bringing those services back online while implementing fixes to ensure those weaknesses or flaws that allowed the incident to occur in the first place are no longer available. And then lessons learned finishes the cycle by ensuring that the organization improves and doesn't make the same mistakes again. And any lessons learned are used to inform the preparation process and the cycle repeats. Ah, uh, in order to prepare for the incident, you have to have the team which could be comprised of things like the management or organizational leadership who makes decisions for the team, the primary conduit to senior management. Ideally, the, the management or organizational leadership team member should have enough seniority to be able to make decisions for the organization in an emergency. You definitely need an, a security staff member, which is the core of the team bringing that incident response and analysis skills. You need your tech experts, things like system administrators or developers. It all depends on the nature of the incident, who you need to call in. You need communications or PR. Uh, you need somebody to handle communication well. Poor or no communications can make incidents worse or damage the organization's reputation, which will hurt the bottom dollar. We may need to get legal or human resources involved uh, if it involves an insider or if we have a legality issue. And we may also need to involve law enforcement for specific issues. Some ways to practice are with things like tabletop exercises where you talk through processes teams would give it a scenario and ask questions on how they would, re would respond, what issues might arise, what they need to do to accomplish assigned tasks. This could be as simple as a brainstorming session or um, there is a game uh, made by, what, what is there, uh, Black Hill Security. 
Um, I think it's called Backdoors and Compromises? Or no, that's written Breaches? But, 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 but no, it's not this one. Uh, Black Hills. It's it's their D and D similar thing. I'll find it. I'll find it and I'll put it on Discord. But they have a they have some rules for a similar way that you can do these things, these tabletop exercises. Uh, there's walkthroughs, another type of exercise where you can take an incident step by step, ensuring members know their roles. This is where you would use tools. You would use a various access, like getting into a building with a special with a special key or uh, you're just testing that everything is accessible to the team when an incident occurs. And of course, there's always simulation where uh, we activate uh, functions or elements of a plan to see that it all works. It could be full scale, kind of like what we do when, um, when we do fire drills or earthquake drills. Uh, your IR plan should have sub plans within them to handle various stages. And everything, of course, should be regularly reviewed and tested. Things like communication, who handles the, the talk with press or media, uh, with uh, stakeholders, a communication with the stakeholders themselves, uh, what, who has knowledge of what, when, a business continuity, keeping the organizational functional when an incident occurs. There's the disaster recovery, the restoration or continuation of services despite a disaster, and the continuity of operation planning. This is a federally sponsored US program that, def uh, that defines the requirements that government agencies need to meet to ensure continuity of operations. Uh, FEMA is part of this, actually. So all of this needs to be written down in policy. That way, everybody knows it must be followed. This needs to be organizational policy. When an incident occurs, who is on deck, uh, for what purpose, what is their role, and what steps need to be taken. I found this a while ago and found it great to, uh, to put this as the slide. Just as a reminder that yes, uh, as defenders, we have to make tactics, we have to make, we have to live by standards and frameworks. We have to, uh, we have to know our systems and for the attacker, they just have to be right once. So in that mindset of we have to follow all these, these rules that are being made and whatnot, there are things like the MITRE ATT&CK framework. ATT&CK stands for the Adversarial Tactics, Techniques, and common knowledge. It includes detailed descriptions, definitions, and examples for the complete threat life cycle. At each level, it lists techniques and components, allows threat assessment modeling to leverage common descriptions and knowledge. At first, this thing looks daunting, but as you play with it, you'll be able to see various groups very, various advanced persistent threat groups from all over the world, and what steps they do when they launch an attack. So that if you were to see a trend of attacks, you could follow that pattern and figure out what APT is launching an attack or what are they doing. It's pretty cool once you have an understanding on how to use it. But I completely get that at first glance, this thing looks scary. Here's another way of looking at uh, attack frameworks and identifying attacks. It's the diamond model. 
of intrusion analysis. It describes a sequence where an adversary deploys a capability targeted at an infrastructure against a victim. It's intended to focus heavily on understanding the attacker and their motivations, and then uses relationships between these elements to allow defenders to both understand the threat and think about what data or information they may need to obtain or have available. This specific model has four terms that you need to be aware of, and that's the events, which are just activities, the core features, which are the vertices, the adversary, capability, the victim, and infrastructure. There's the meta features, the start and end timestamps, the phase, the result, the direction, methodology, resources used to order events into a sequence, otherwise called as an activity thread, and the confidence value, typically undefined by the model, but analysts are expected to determine the confidence value based on their work. The cyber kill chain is a third attack framework that you should be familiar with. This one is specifically from Lockheed Martin. They have a seven step. The first one being reconnaissance, where you identify your targets. The weaponization, where you create a tool to exploit that vulnerability. The delivery, whether that's an email, a thumb drive, a website, or other way of getting that, uh, that payload to the target. The exploitation, when the exploit is ran, when the uh, person was socially engineered. Installation, uh, where the persistent backdoor is created. The command and control, which allows that access that communication now that the tool was installed. And then from there is the action on objectives, which is basically either getting credentials, escalating privileges, the, the rest of, of the madness. These are three that you should be familiar with. You don't have to be a full-on expert of, but you should be familiar what the, the MITRE ATT&CK framework looks like, the diamond model, and the cyber kill chain. Switching gears into a very useful tool family, the Security Information and Event Management System, otherwise known as a SIEM. SIEM devices and software have broad security capabilities based on the ability to collect and aggregate log data from a variety of sources and perform correlation and analysis activity with that data, review and alert on user behavior or perform analysis and packet capture to correlate with other tools like an IDS, an IPS, a firewall, or other security events. They give you alerting, reporting, and response capabilities. Most seams come with a dashboard, which gives you kind of like this, an overall view of everything that's happening. They all have to have a sensor that gathers data. Uh, they all have to, you have to configure their sensitivity and their thresholds. They, the tool won't know it out of the box. You have to set it up as it gathers up information and analyzes and starts doing all kinds of graphs, you, you'll start to see trends. Uh, you should set alerts and alarms, but you obviously don't wanna set too many because alert fatigue is a real thing. And, and if you get it too much, uh, too many alerts and you just start ignoring them. So you'll miss any big uh, things that are happening. Correlation and analysis is a function of seams that help you uh, get data points together to, um, to solidify, hey, an incident is happening. Rules uh, would be the, the thing that you set in order to trigger alarms. 
again, poor, uh, poorly written rules will give you false positives or just not give you the proper information. These tools take in log files. And the more universal it can take log files, the better, with Splunk being one, being one of the best. So for example, Splunk can take in everything from Windows logs to Linux logs to DNS logs, authentication, dump files, all kinds of things. You want a tool like that, that can take in anything and process it all for you. Because there's a lot of log files to look at. And it can be overwhelming. Especially when we're talking uh, different operating systems, different services, uh, open source or commercial. Everybody makes logs in different ways. There's no one uniform way of doing it. So using tools like Splunk will make your life so much easier when dealing with events. Metadata is generated as a normal part of system operations, communications, or any other activities. There are four different types of metadata that you need to be familiar with that show up on the test. Things like email metadata, which is like the, the header, that has the sender, the recipient, the date and time, attachments, what systems the email traveled to, any header markups. Uh, there is the mobile metadata, things like call logs, texts, uh, GPS location, uh, cell tower information. There is web metadata, which are like meta tags, headers, cookies, uh, any search engine optimization, website functionality and file, uh, when the file was created, how it was created, if and when modified, who modified it, GPS, and so on. This EXIF tool is one used to output such metadata information from pictures. Now, continuing from uh, in incident response, to the mitigation and recovery part of incident response. A playbook is a step-by-step -step guide intended to help teams take the right action in a given scenario. They're built for each type of incident or event that they believe they are likely to handle. Normally they'll have stages with steps and at each step will be a set of guidelines when to activate the playbook and who should be involved. They'll take into account industry best practices, organizational policies, laws, regulation, and so on. So it's all pre-written before an action, before an event happens. It's best that they are written before and not after, because it just gives you a what to do when something happens. Uh, what was that picture for? Oh, still mitigation recovery. Okay. There is, oh, I, I realized what that picture was for. Uh, there's the run book, operational procedures uh, that, that help perform actions, simplifying the decision process. They're normally tied with the playbooks. There is the secure orchestration automation and response or SOAR. Uh, those platforms allow you to quickly assess the attack surface of an organization, the state of the systems, and where issues may exist, along with automation of remediation and restoration workflows. Now that picture. The containment mitigation and recovery techniques. One of the first mitigation techniques is to quickly block the cause of the incident on the impacted device by reconfiguring endpoint security solutions, such as using whitelists or blacklists to allow certain uh, applications or files or prevent them from being uh, ran or installed. There's also quarantining. 
um, as another mitigation technique. It could be configuring uh, changes. So for example, addressing the security vulnerability that allowed the incident to occur, to isolate a system or a network. Everything should be carefully tracked and recorded. Uh, when you do a configuration change, you gotta keep track of things like the firewall, uh, any data loss prevention, content filtering, uh, updating or revoking certificates. And then when it comes to removing, we're talking to things like isolation, uh, removing a system into a protected space or network work where it can be kept away from other systems. There's containment where the system is still left in place, uh, but we have uh, further actions done to limit itself like uh, firewall rules to limit traffic. And there's also segmentation that should be employed before an incident occurs uh, for systems that have various functions. This can be done either virtually with like VLANs or in the cloud. That way, when a incident occurs, it's only a small segment of the network that's affected and not the entire. Any questions on incident response? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to digital forensics. The other half of the DFIR. Organizations use digital forensic techniques for tasks from responding to legal cases to conducting internal investigations and supporting the incident response process. A key element of digital forensics is the acquisition and analysis of data from drives, files, any copies of live memory, and so on. Documentation created in digital forensics will contain timestamps, file metadata, event logs, and artifacts. The human side of digital forensics, which are with things like interviews, uh, is important to get clues to build a comprehensive forensic report. Digital forensics starts when litigation is pending or is anticipated to happen. Legal counsel will send a legal or litigation hold, which is a a notice that informs an organization that they must preserve data and records that might be destroyed or modified in the course of operations. So any backups, paper documents, or electronic files must be preserved. Legal holds are the first part of an electronic discovery or e-discovery process. Discovery process can also use the Freedom of Information Act requests to obtain information. This picture shows you the nine stages to describe the discovery process. There's the information governance, which assesses what data exists before the fact, allowing scoping and control of what data needs to be provided. There's identification of data so you know what you have and where it is. The preservation, to ensure data isn't changed or destroyed. The collection of data to be processed and managed. The processing of data to remove any unneeded or ir irrelevant information. Preparing for review and analysis by formatting or collating. This review to ensure that the data contains only what it's supposed to and that data that shouldn't be shared is not included. 
is the analysis of data for key elements like topics, terms, individuals, or organizations. The production of data to provide to third parties or uh, those involved in legal proceedings. And finally, the presentation of data in court testimony or further analysis with experts. So you see digital forensics has a different tone. Whereas incident response, we are, as the, the term says, we're responding to something that happened. With digital forensics, we have our eye on the court system, on the eye of everything we do will be, will be uh, scrutinized and presented in a court of law. So acquiring the data, acquiring the forensic data requires going through uh, in order of volatility or what data is most likely to be lost due to system operations or normal processes. Security Plus expects you to be familiar with these seven in this order. That the first to be changed would be the CPU cache and registers. Then would be things like the routing table, the ARP cache, uh, process table, kernel statistics. Then would be RAM. Then any temporary files or soft space. Then data on a disk. Then any remote logs and backup. You should be familiar with them. And the order of which is going to change the fastest. It is important for a case that a chain of custody is maintained and tracked anytime any evidence is assessed, transferred, or handled. Evidence in court is legally admissible if it's offered to prove the facts of a case and doesn't violate the law. Criteria such as relevance and reliability whether the evidence was obtained legally and whether the evidence is authentic are all applied. The admissibility for digital forensics requires that data be intact and unaltered before and during the forensic process. Analysts must be able to demonstrate that they have the appropriate skills, use appropriate tools and techniques. They documented their actions in a reliable and testable manner very much a scientific process of if an analyst found a, a, um, a picture file on a file, then another expert should be able to follow the exact same steps to find the same picture. When it comes to cloud forensics, because we can't ignore the cloud, Organizations have to ensure that they work closely with their cloud providers to preserve and produce any data that's necessary for a case, uh, like the right to audit clauses that should be part of a contract between the cloud service and an organization. This will allow a direct ability to audit the cloud provider or use a third party to do so. There are regulatory and jurisdictions that have to be kept in mind. Regulations vary depend on where the cloud service provider operates and where its headquarters. The law that covers data, services, or infrastructure may not be the laws that you have locally, regionally, or in the country. So we have to think about uh, jurisdictional concerns. There's also data breach notification laws that vary depending where on planet Earth the data breach occurred. Acquiring forensic data from cloud providers is unlikely. Forensic data from the service itself is rarely handed over to customers. Organizations use cloud services must have a plan to handle potential incidents and investigations that don't rely on direct forensic technique. 
Some tools that you should be familiar with that show up on the test are things like DD, the Linux CLI tool, FTK Imager, uh, WinHex, MemDump, and Volatility. Since network traffic data is ephemeral, which means it goes away, capturing traffic for forensic investigations requires a direct effort to capture and log the data in advance. If network traffic isn't actively logged, firewall, IDS, IPS, email server, authentication logs could all be lost. Network taps, uh, span ports or port mirrors can be useful for network forensics, but also result in a massive amount of data. Let's also not forget that virtual machines have logs. Virtual machines are actively used and should also be kept in mind along with containers that all require planning ahead of time and having the right tools to get the information out of containers and VMs for an investigation. And no matter where you get your data from, all data should be hashed, all data should be validated that any copies are all identical to the, to the first. Uh, documenting the, the prop, provenance, where an image or drive came from and what happened to it, is critical to the presentation of a forensic analysis by using forensic suites and manual processes like pictures, written notes, documenting chain of custody, the processes and steps made in the creation and analysis of images will all yield a strong case and ensure the repudiation isn't jeopardized in a legal case. So again, where incident response is, we notice a breach is underway, so we got to react to it. Digital forensics has to think much more methodically. Uh, it, it has to have all its processes in place and follow the letter of the law so that if the, the drive or the evidence has to go to court, it's not thrown out because it was captured in an illegal manner. File recovery is a common need for organizations due to the inadvertent deletion and system problems or errors. The ability to recover data relies on the fact that deleting a file from a drive or a device is non-destructive. The file's information from the drive's file index may be deleted and allows the space to be reused. Quick formatting, a drive simply deletes the file index instead of overwriting or wiping the drive. Files can be partially overwritten and recovered in fragments. Forensic analysts rely on reading through Slack space to recover files or file fragments. And secure deletion tools or other anti-forensic techniques can prevent tools from recovering information. Security Plus has a focus on autopsy the open source forensic suite with broad capabilities. You should also be at least aware of the two big commercial software that's used by law enforcement and organizations, which are FTK from Access Data and NCASE from Guidance Software. A quick view of reporting. Digital forensic reports need to be useful and contain relevant information without delving into every technical nuance and detail that the analyst may have found during the investigation. Typical forensic reports have things like the summary investigations, the outline of the forensic process, the tools used and assumptions made, series of sections detailing the findings of each device and each drive, accuracy 
is critical and all conclusions must be backed up with evidence, along with any recommendations or conclusions in more details than in the summary. Let's also not forget that digital forensics plays a role in strategic intelligence and counterintelligence efforts, such as analyzing adversarial actions and technology to include in behaviors of APT tools, the advanced persistent threat tools and processes, or intelligence operations when systems are recovered or acquired. Tools used by both forensic practitioners and intelligence or counterintelligence overlap to do things like break encryption, analyze software or hardware, and even recover data. Security Plus does not dive further than that into the realm of incident response and digital forensics. It does expect you to be familiar with it, uh, familiar with the topics that we covered, familiar with the tools mentioned. You will see those kinds of things on the test, but they don't expect you to be a forensics expert. Are there any questions as I am showing the work for this week? Well, so you know questions. Uh, this is the work of the week. Completing a minimum of three trihackney rooms that deal with things like digital forensics. Here, I have a picture of me searching in trihackney for autopsy, and there's two of three rooms that you could use to get through and add as your submission for this work. So if you can find the third room that deals with forensics, that would be all three. Uh, if you also find three rooms that deal with incident response, that works too. You can mix and match however you want, but it's a minimum of three trihackney rooms that deal with either forensics or incident response or both. Lastly, I will remind you what I put in Discord earlier today that there are 28 days left to submit all assignments, all quizzes and everything for the class. As that number keeps going down, I will be reminding everybody. That way you are well aware that you have 28 remaining days to get all caught up with the course. And remember, you can submit something late for no penalty up until that due until date. In the case of this assignment, as, uh, let me move this down a bit. The due date is December 7, 11.59 p.m. Pacific. So we are about 28 days away from that due until date. Once we reach December 7, 11.59, you will not be able to submit anything else and there won't be any exceptions made. This is why I will continue to ping everyone on our Discord server and remind of the, the dwindling amount of time because this grace period will be ending soon. Any questions before I end the stream? Quick question. Yes. The practice exam that we have on Canvas for credit, is that going to be available to us after December 7th in so if for, you want, for if you, the exam? If you want to take this test after December 7th, because yes, the, the Cabrillo course will stop uh, being available to you. My suggestion is to go to my site. And under free courses, you will see 
uh, this exact course. Just enroll under the free enrollment and you'll see a carbon copy of the class. I actually use the free enrollment site to create this course. I just copy it over from that into Cabrillo. Okay. So yes, once December 7 hits, this entire course will no longer be accessible at Cabrillo's site, but you can always access any and all of my courses from my page and be able to enroll there and, and be able to see it. As I update it, as I make changes, it'll, it'll update. But yeah, you are more than welcome to sign up here uh, on wherever it says free enrollment and see the course in its entirety. So you already know ahead of time what it's gonna look like and be able to do things like what you're suggesting of continuing to practice the test after December 7. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, related to that. So if we want to take the exam before and receive credit for it for the class, um, so then do we need to basically have the class scheduled before December 7th? Is that the, the what needs to happen? I am not sure I follow. Okay, so uh, I think you said previously that if we take and pass the exam, correct, that we get an automatic A for the course. That is correct. correct. That is correct. So then kind of what is the, so do we, does that, um, Do we have to schedule our exam basically before December 7th to get that? That would be most ideal. Okay, right. Uh, looking, at it, looking at this ahead. Yeah. We just finished these two chapters today. Right. Next week, we're going to do these two chapters. Yeah. And we will complete the entire content. Mm -hmm. From there, the rest of the semester, what I will do for an hour is do questions from here where okay. you guys, where I'll walk you through the, the mindset that I use when I take the test, any test taking tips and all that. Uh, but we're just gonna do that until the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. So you can use that time to, to ask questions, to te test yourself and you know, schedule yourself to take the test. So you're not just doing it without any uh, prep ahead. So, right. so you know, we have one more week of lecture, and then after that is nothing but test prep. Right, great, okay. So I would say anything, anything in between, schedule your, your exam. There'll right. be at least one, one Tuesday in between these two dates, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And do you have a suggestion for either uh, in person or online for taking the test? Um, that is your preference. Mm. Um, I've done it both ways. I have gone in person to do them. And during the pandemic, I did the pen test plus. Um, mm. the, what I would say is if you want to do it at home, uh, be ready to install spyware. Right. And be okay with that and having two cameras looking at you the whole time. Right. Um, if you go down that road, the way that I did it was I used uh, my laptop uh, and my phone because they wanted a, a pictures of the room that I was doing it in and a picture of me. And then as soon as the, the test was done, I reinstalled the OS on the laptop. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. I just, I just started cleaning. If you want to go down that road of doing it from home. Uh, Pearson View Centers are open again, so if you don't want to deal with that, you mm -hmm. would drive up to the nearest Pearson View Center and take the test. Okay, great. Thank Either you. way, it, it's not how you take the test, it's do you pass it. And it does, also doesn't matter what score you get, as long as you passed, that's, that's all that anybody cares. It's not like high school where what's your GPA? You, you passed. That's all we care. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. So looking at the calendar, we actually have two Tuesdays between uh, this, the, the day that we do these two and December 7th. So on um, those, those two upcoming Tuesdays, I'm just gonna go through these Security Plus questions and we'll answer them together, as many as we can in the time that we have. So yeah, so that's the look for the, uh, the remainder of the course. Good questions. Any others? <laughs>